the first question that I always start with every episode, uh, and I know this is a bit of a different one because normally I do this one-on-one, so it's a bit exciting to have a full panel here with Nat, Alex, and Ian. But what's what's each of your earliest memories of being a creative person? What's the first thing you remember doing? Probably using my dad's video camera. when I was, I was the only person in my family who knew how to use it. So when I was like seven, dad got like this old... You know, your classic dad camera. And I was the only one who knew how to use it. So that was pretty my first memory of doing film was just like filming our family holidays and making stupid videos of me scaring my dad. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen, have, have you, you watched, seen, them have back? watched them back? Yeah, some of them are so ridiculous. Like, oh my God, so good. <laughs> yeah. anyway. Ian, what's yours? Um, well, my. Both of my older brothers were musicians, uh, so you know, just uh, casual musicians. But one, the older one particularly, is a very good guitarist, and so I remember so sort of watching him and being totally inspired to do it, and then to play guitar. And then I think the creative side of it came from I would just get my guitar, and I had a like a ghetto blaster, and I would record onto a ghetto blaster just like something basic and then get another ghetto blaster and sort of record over that and keep on dumping, going between the two tapes. So you record yourself playing on again, you know, so it's similar theory to an actual proper tape machine, but it ends up just being (laughs) so much noise because of all the background (laughs) and everything. So, yeah, I remember just being like actually being pretty amazed that I could create something myself that sounded like, multiple people or whatever and you know was it I've still of, got the time. yeah i was gonna yeah. ask do you still have it because then you know did, yeah. you, did you find it was hard to sort of figure out how to layer it effectively like how long did it take before you started to optimize you know the layering I, that way i can just remember doing it lots so i think the some of some of them probably sounded better than others but i mean there was no um science involved in it it was just doing it you know just having the i'd I had a ghetto blaster and my brother had a slightly better one and I'd go and steal his out of his bedroom and put them in front of each other and do this back and forwards thing, switch the tape into the other one. Yeah. it's awesome. What about you, Alex? Similar to Nat? I don't know. I suppose getting my first drum kit, um, I got it pretty young. So figuring out how to play the drums, really, like just bashing around and eventually figuring out that. But, yeah. I found a photo the other day of me playing a drum kit and I was really small. And it's like, like a normal size drum kit, but it looks like <laughs> massive. Did you have lessons straight away pretty much? Um, I don't think so. I think it was like a year or so before I got a lesson. So I kind of probably learned a whole bunch of bad habits. Jeez, your poor parents. Out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so together, like over the years, you guys, you know, ended up Alex and Nat, you're obviously, you know, in filmography and, and doing a lot of those things in, obviously you're in Powderfinger and now you run Airlock Studios. How did the concept of Up in the Airlock come about for you guys to all work together? Like, where did you meet? How did this idea was, how was it birthed? I feel like it was Steve and Doig we're chatting about doing some live stuff and then we came out to the studio and met you in and then it kind yeah, of went yeah. from there. Just, you know, that was that two and a half years ago. Yeah. I was going to say Steve was the conduit definitely for me. Like I'd been, I'd been planning on doing something like this for year, like for 10 years, the studio for 20 years or more. And so when I started to have a bit more time here, I wanted to do something and I just never really met the right people to do it with because obviously I don't know what the fuck I'm doing with cameras or anything like that. So, like, I needed someone to partner with and then meet these guys and it's sort of – I think one of the, with in these sort of creative situations, I think one of the most important things is that that you um, you get along well and you can sort of bounce bounce ideas off each other and sort of it be a – safe and happy space and that it just felt like that with these guys so well just on on that note though you know how how is it you know talking about uh, getting to a common goal and kind of understanding a little bit about each other's professions but not enough to really understand it fully 
it's I could imagine it's kind of sitting in a room and being like, well, I know nothing about that, so whatever you want to do. But is that actually the best way forward? And is that what you guys did? I think yeah, it's yeah, really. trial and error, right? Like we tried a whole heap of stuff. Like when we shot the Jensen's, like that was kind of our first one and we learned a lot from that on both sides. Like what worked sound-wise, what worked camera-wise. You know, I think that was that was probably how we kind of figured it out, right? Yeah, I think so. And I'm, and I guess my role in this whole thing is because I don't do engineering all the time either, I'm, I'm not super fast at it. So I get someone on my side, on the audio side, I get someone to, to do that so I can kind of sit back and sort of witness the whole thing, make sh- you know, just sort of watch the whole thing as a third person sort of thing because if someone's doing that, I think it can, it can sort of – things can – everyone focuses on their little bit and you don't end up with the, the overall thing. Like if, you know, if I'm spending too much time worrying about what the snare sounds like, then I, then I forget that, that there's a song involved sort of thing. And w- whereas um, like we had an example the other night when we were doing a shoot and this band did, did a shoot and it was sort of okay. They went through everything and then they were They screwed up one song. And so we we're going to do one song again. And then, I, I was just sitting there and I went, you know what? The whole thing wasn't very good. And it takes a bit of courage to say that to, to the band because everyone's just done it and the, these guys have put the time in filming it. But just just saying that to the band, they all went, you know what? It really wasn't. We weren't feeling it. Let's do it again. And so someone someone has to, to be able to say that because the camera people are focusing on the angles and, you know, whereas I was actually just listening and watching and I wasn't feeling it. Do you think that so I think that's my role in, in this this thing to help in those moments? And Do obviously think- doing all your amazing interviews. Yeah, yeah. Well, which which one day will come? Will get be swept off the cutting room floor? <laughs> no, the, the new ones are really good. The new ones are just they're a good vibe. I really, yeah. This yeah, new season, they're really good. Yeah. Do you think like that's a that's generally a problem? Because hearing what you just said there, in you know, I can think of a bunch of times where people were afraid to pro- approach artists or assume artists wanted a certain level of treatment that the artists themselves don't want, and it's almost like yeah. the artists aren't even aware. Like, was there times you know in Powderfinger and and when you were kicking around as an artist that you'd hear things where it's like that's not actually what I want. Like, I was at a festival and Tones and I it was like, don't look Tones and I in the eye. I met Tones and I, she was great. Like, she didn't have any problem with that but it's this like protection and fear around that that just doesn't actually yeah. exist well there's there's a fair i mean it happens in every every profession like the the whole chinese whispers sort of you know thing if someone if tones and i had, had jokingly said that don't look me in the eye to someone and then someone thought she was serious and she says to someone else you know then it ends up being that people think that that's the case and then oh fuck she's a real diva sort of thing but it's not the case and like I've been in in situations definitely where where people have thought that we'd in Powderfinger and in the church now the band that I'm in we do quite a bit of you know ra- radio shows and all that sort of stuff in uh, in the states when we go in and and get filmed you know we've done KEXP which is a is a really good one over there and a similar sort of thing to what we're trying to do here but in a in an actual TV studio sort of feeling thing and there quite often the people are sort of disarmed by the fact that that we're actually normal people and we we're happy to work with them with with what they want right with you know and they're happy to work with us rather than it being a preconceived idea of what the church should actually look and sound like because that chinese whispers and and the the version that that they think you've become is is quite often not the case you actually want to do something that's maybe a bit more um, looking forward or looking back sort of thing, you know, it's, yeah. And thinking about, you know, you said KEXP in there, obviously that was what I could imagine was an inspiration for Up in the Airlock. Alex, is what? there certain sort of things that you saw in KEXP or maybe Tiny Desk that you think worked really well that you wanted to bring over and other things you wanted to purposely do a little bit different? <clears throat> in general, I mean, we've, we love those things. Like I've always loved watching live, um, live streaming things like KXP and Tiny Desk and Radiohead did a really amazing one. 
Corona. But we've always felt that, like, well, honestly, um, that could be done more cinematically. Like, one thing that Nat and I really focus on a lot is, like, um, we do a lot of music videos and, you know, we, every time we do a music video, we kind of like to push ourselves skill-wise because we really use them as, like, opportunities to push ourselves as, as, as directors and DOPs. So we thought that sort of thing that we've really seen missing from a lot of these live sessions all around the world is it's really, really just really focused on the music, which is obviously needs to be the, probably the main focus. It needs to sound good, obviously, but it could also like, I think that there's a lot that you can add to the feel and the expression of the artist to, to really paint the picture of what their music's all about by how it's lit and how you deliver that content. So in just in the same way as a music video, you'll shoot it to the mood of the song to suit what the, the song's about and, and all of that to really paint the picture of the, the mood and the tone. We're really trying to do that with our Up in the Air sessions. So you'll notice that, and especially in this second season, we've kind of upped our production value again since the first season. Um, you'll notice that they all look different and they're all really stylized towards that band to just help accentuate the mood and tone of the music itself. And that's something we hadn't seen in heaps of live sessions um, before. Um, yeah. As you know, Tiny Desk and KXP always look the same in the studio. And that's their it's style. Right? Really well. But they, it's, it's beautifully done. But our style is we've got the same room that we're shooting in, but every session we rethink how we're going to light that room and how our cameras are going to move within that room to suit that artist. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, we had a band on this last season that we're shooting at the moment. We had these massive LED walls outside the windows for the nighttime sessions. And on those LED walls, we programmed all of this video footage um, to basically really suit that band, you know, um, and it was really fucking cool. It gave it a completely different vibe. Um, Are you saying that you can't do that with GoPros? Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> Ian and Steve just wanted to put the whole thing on one GoPro in the corner, but uh, we had to fight for it. We had to fight hard for the red camera. They're <laughs> <laughs> stirring. They're stirring me up. <laughs> well, this this was shot on like I remember you said, Alex. This was shot on a a um a pre release of a red camera or something, right? Yeah, so we were testing a testing one out, um, which is a new red Raptor, which is a stupidly good camera, um, new eight K. It wasn't entirely shot on that. We had actually I think six red cameras all up, so. We were shooting on a mix between um, Red Komodos, Red Dragons, and Red Raptor. And we had one C200 as well, drum can. Yeah, only on one of the shoots, I think. These are all pretty gnarly names. I've to store everything on. <laughs> oh, oh, God. God. It is. Storage is yeah. insane. Absolutely <laughs> insane. The amount of data we go through. So, and what's the total amount of data we're talking then? For like the whole season? Uh, season? Uh, we're up to about seven terabytes, I think. It's yeah, five terabytes per session. session. Yeah, but then backup as well because we've got the, yeah, so it would actually be more than that. It would be about 10. Jeez. It's just a lot because you're rolling the whole time on, you know, six or eight cameras. Mm. Um, and obviously, like, we don't cut at all and we slate all the cameras and then everyone will talk for a bit. And then, that was your job. Nah. Yeah, I know. I was like, for everyone else, yeah, it, like, it was my first time slating. And you, you did know, a great you know. job. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I was so surprised how many cameras there were around. You're like, oh, look through this way and be careful not to cut off that. And I'm like, what the hell's going on? So I don't think uh, Baz Lerman or anything will be calling on me anytime soon, but I appreciate, appreciate the, um, giving me a chance. So from a from an audio perspective then, Ian, is that like a lot of data compared to the audio sessions? Like do you have a, a data okay. issue with that? I mean, we're running obviously I think, you know, up to sort of maybe maybe near thirty tracks are going down sort of thing. But I mean it's yeah, it's it's certainly manageable without switching out hard drives during the thing. Like as long as you start with a fresh hard drive, it's fine. And sort of, you know, it's it's essentially as long as you. I mean, it'd be a disaster if if 
it, the, everything crashed at the sort of 29 minute mark if you're trying to do a half an hour thing because it's kind of you, you I don't even know how you you know because you can't stop it between each song or anything because it's been slated so yeah touch wood that that hasn't happened and, slated and, by the best too yeah I mean I guess that there's always the the opportunity of doing an analog backup as you're going but then you'd have to settle with the mix that you're doing as you're doing it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit sort of, you know, a bit hairy. Sometimes it feels a bit hairy if it keeps going on and, you know, you're up near the 40-minute mark without pressing stop and saving. Yeah, I bet. So how do you guys pick the, the bands that go on it then? Is there, like, strategy around getting the mix right for a whole season? Or is it about just who's hot right now? Kind of. I think it's a bit of both, but not really who's hot. I think it's just like we all kind of bring a band and then there's like we look at what else, like who else is kind of, you know. That's kind of how we pick. It's kind of everyone kind of like puts bands towards and we reach out and then we're like, you know, that's kind of how we've gone so far. Obviously season one, two, two was season one as well, was entire because we did it during quarantine. So it was entirely limited to Southeast Queensland bands. And it's we're just lucky that there's such a, an amazing diverse pool of talent in in the in our area. Really. And As an overall like mandate though, I suppose, our the whole concept behind Up in the Airlock is to expose awesome bands. Um, yeah. new bands like small bands, medium bands and large bands. And obviously we can't have all small unknown bands um, on because we need an audience to show them to. So kind of how we booking, how we like our booking works is we try and get, you know, like a touring band or like a, a um, you know, a bigger name band with a big audit, pre-existing audience and we'll pair them with a up and coming local band. So yep. for each session, like, you know, if there's 10 episodes in a season, there's going to be five sort of strong big names that will help us get our, our viewership up. And then we've also got five bands that we think are the fucking coolest bands ever. Exactly. And basically um, then we're able to sort of piggyback off the bigger band's audience for exposure. And like even just on that last season, I mean, looking at what happened, we, we did a session with Void before anyone really had heard of Void. And it just, I believe it was so great for their for them at that time, like it was just people had heard them and maybe seen them, but they just rocked this session so hard. And so did um, JB Patterson. Yeah, JB um, Patterson was amazing. He was amazing. And, and on this season, we've, we've, we're doing the same thing. We've got some epic bands that everyone will know. Um, and then we've got some bands that some people may not know that, you know, it's funny. They like a band that is sort of up and coming as well. They really like, go for it like they take it so seriously and it's like you know not saying they do better performances but you know that the pressure is good and they're like um they really bring it um yeah uh, i don't know are we mentioning band names in this when's this coming no, out? No, let's keep it a secret yeah okay. i think as well i think as well just saying what just going forward from what you said as well alex it's just like as we as we get like as we do more seasons we want to get bigger and bigger bands like to expose these amazing Australian local bands. Like, that was the point where we first started up in the airlock. So, like, yeah, that, that, that was the main moment. Yeah. So that, we, so that we could end up, and I always joke about using, I use Lenny Kravitz as an example, but I want, I want, when Lenny Kravitz comes to town, I want him to want to do it, you know, because it's really good. As the production quality is good and that it sounds great, looks great. And then, obviously, if that's the case and someone like him is on there and then you get all of that watchership listenership whatever you call it across the world and then void people will see the void session you know and so everyone's a winner really in in the question and i reckon that um we don't have we're not genre specific like some things some of these sort of sh sort of shows that you see popping up they are really kind of curated to be genre specific our criteria is just that demands have to be good like it really, you know, I mean, I can't see us doing an opera one, really, but it's sort of, it's pretty diverse what we're covering. Yeah. I mean, opera is sick. 
I mean, I'd, I'd be, I'd be down on that. <laughs> I'm picturing the fifth element, like in the fifth element, element that's the opera. Yeah. A classic movie. So in in saying about, because when you guys mention the bands that you were surprised really bring it that are, you know, uh, emerging bands, I think I'm thinking of the one that you're thinking of. But thinking about in when you were sort of, you know, you've been in bands of all different sizes, how how would you recommend emerging bands keep the fire in their belly? Like what's the trick to that long term if they were to form into a band the size of Powderfinger, for example? Uh, I think that's so multifaceted. I think one of the, the main things, though, is take take the music seriously but don't take yourself too seriously. And um, um, I don't know, just just do your best. Do your best at everything you, you're doing and be prepared. That's all you can do, you know, and don't try and, don't try and do anything for anyone else. You're doing it for yourselves. That's always my advice. Certainly don't become a, a musician to to make money or become famous. That's a terrible idea. Like you, you're doing it. You're doing it because you love music. <laughs> like how all of us are laughing. Are laughing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing. I guess it's ringing true for all of us. Yeah. So <laughs> I would like with, with, you know, with the, the time and place with Powderfinger, we were very lucky. It's very It's very rare situation that that happens and I certainly – you know, I'm very grateful that we had the opportunity for us, us to grow into what we did. But yeah, I mean, none of us in that band were doing it to to make money. Like that wasn't that wasn't the motivation. And do you feel and so, like you've? Yeah, I was going to say, do you feel like you've taken that forward into church? Into the church? I'm, I haven't joined. Sorry, I'm, the church. Not a, not a, I haven't. I haven't, <laughs> haven't born again. Um, the word "the" is very important, there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, well, the church, the church is obviously a very independent band. That I mean, they've been thrown off every label in, in the world, as far as I know. And you know, they're pretty. They've had some prickly times across the years. With and you know, it's definitely it's it's not it's not um, commercial music. That's for sure. You know, so yeah, we when we're making music, it's, it's to challenge ourselves and to challenge an audience, really. Cool. And what did you guys feel, you know, you learnt most from season one to season two then? What was the, the biggest learning? Having our cameras, like our setup, just staying with our setup. I think that was the biggest the biggest one. Like we figured, we really figured out how to work the room and make it look a lot bigger than what it is. Like that's one thing like a lot of people say when they, you know, we with the camera, like how we shoot it makes it look a lot bigger. I mean, it's a massive room, but how we shoot it. So I think that was probably one of our biggest, you know, just have, finding the best way for sound and cameras yeah, yeah. and really utilising space. Because, like, having so many cameras and bodies in there, like, you saw it, uh, it's insane, like, how much we fit into the room. Yeah. yeah. But I think also, now you guys definitely do. You stick with the same people. And I think that the, the consistency of that, apart from the fact that people start to, as well as the fact, sorry, people start to, to feel like they've got some ownership of it as well and so they get excited by it, whether it's the hire companies or the, the, the you know, the other camera people or whatever. Yeah. It's great. If it's the same people throughout it, everyone everyone's proud of what, what they've done. Absolutely, yeah. And I think season two is definitely a lot more, like production value-wise, it's going to be something else. Hope everyone likes yeah, it. I, I, I think the people's a big one. Like it, it is like everyone that was in the first. It is pretty much the same crew, and we just added people. Actually, if anything, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, like working through everything that we worked through to get to what up in the air like was in the first season. Like we, it's a, it's an interesting shaped room, so it's a, it's quite a challenge to yeah. figure out how to shoot in it. And then once we nailed it, and then like you know. Painting the whole, got all like all the walls inside painted black to change the help with the color and like, you know, really nailed it down. And then you know we were it was really obvious in, in the edits as well, like just um, our ability to capture the bands and our camera angles and you know the way that we, you know, after you've edited like ten episodes of something, you know what needs to be fixed into the next session. 
so going into this, everyone was super stoked. Um, yeah, um, to be coming back and with all these like cool ideas as well. So it was pretty exciting. Yeah, because there's only so many ways you can light and shoot a room. So like having and having like four or five people involved in that process is really fun. Like we're like, oh yeah, now we can do this and we can put a camera up here and we can punch light through there and you know, like it's just super fun to like figure out how we're gonna do it differently and then putting the LED walls like outside, that was just my favourite. Mm-hmm. It looks so sick. Because there's yeah, like big, you know, big windows and like we made it look like it was moving, like the outside was moving because like We've really lent into the space thing, as because why not? Because we love yeah, real yeah. space and aliens. Um, so yeah, it's it's going to be cool. It's going to be really cool. And so obviously, it, it's an expensive looking production. It's a beautiful space. You guys know what you're doing. You've got expensive gear everywhere. Like, how does this thing get funded? How do you how do you fund something other than just the passion for it? Um, well, the first season was fully self-funded by everyone that worked on it because it was like when COVID first hit we were all just like let's just do it um and no one had to work on so everyone just did it yeah it was just like everyone just did it so everyone kind of just did it for you know it was actually um like especially our grip company who, who do the lighting and the camera movement stuff um he, they were all out of work, and as were we. Like all, everything just stopped at the start of um, COVID for pretty much every everyone, but obviously the film industry too. But then, because of JobKeeper, he was able to put a bunch of his crew on JobKeeper. So actually, the first season was kind of everything was in kind, but it was a great way that people were like, "Well, there's no work on." You know, it's it's impossible to ask of a of a film crew and a sound studio and everything to like shoot 10 episodes of something completely for free because they're big days massive days you know like it's not like it's two hours for weeks but like in that unique position like none of us had any work on at all like so we were able to do that for the first one for the second one we got a grant um and what we're doing at the moment is basically uh, packaging this whole thing up and, and uh, looking for a yes, some sponsorship money and also a distribution partner potentially as well. So long term, I think that that's how it'll be funded. Obviously, we need to get our viewership up. So everything in these early days is just sort of building the groundwork. So we've got an audience that is big enough and powerful enough for us to be able to sell advertising on. So how does distribution work then? Like, because isn't the modern distribution YouTube or Vimeo? Like, what's the what's the other options? Yeah, I think um, we could look at some online stuff, um, like Amazon Music, or you know, we can go down that route. Like, I think that you know, we're not stuck to sticking on YouTube, you know. And then there's like the whole Web three space that's blowing up at the moment that is another option that we're looking into. So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, or just as I mean. Even like if you look at Tiny Desk, they have their own their own platform, but it it all ends up on YouTube anyway to make it more accessible for for people. So it, it's probably going to end up being some kind of <clears throat> hybrid situation, I would think, to make it accessible for people. But our ultimate goal is that you know, as well as um, providing these great assets for for bands for free, essentially to use however they want. Um, all of the crew are getting work and paid well to do something good. Eventually, it'd be great if the band actually got paid something to do it because that's kind of a hurdle situation. When, when you go and do these things, normally you're just signing a release form and letting them get, do what they want. And if they make money out of the, the, the other, those platforms, would be definitely making money, but the bands don't see it. So it would be good if we can share some of that with artists. Because it's harder and harder. Everyone, everyone wants something for free these days. Or consumers, are, you know, people struggle to to pay for a like a streaming service premium that costs less than what it would have cost someone in my generation to buy one CD. And you've got every every song ever made available at your hands. You know, so people, it's 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 difficult times for artists and creatives to actually subsist. So you think- if, if we can be a part of something, some kind of changing tide, that'd be unreal. 
I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for like an Apple Music or an Amazon Music. I don't quite know if Spotify has the infrastructure there to think about a pay-per-view element for, for you know, something like this. We've considered all of that sort of stuff, I guess. But, I mean, it scares people away. Like, yeah, like if, 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 I pay for it. Yeah, if you, people just, you know, even if you ask them for 10 cents to, to view something, which is about 10,000 times more than what Spotify play for for one play people people balk at 10 cents because it's too it's too awkward until it it becomes sort of compulsory or something i i don't i mean what do you do like it's then then people will complain that there's no freedom of choice so i don't know do you think it's um do you think there was a defining point other than streaming that sort of you know devalued music do you think there was like one point or I think it was the whole Napster thing, um, and record companies dropped the ball and didn't didn't um, develop their own, and then that sort of and also the the um the, the just the whole model that people are uh, being paid by. Like if I if I pay a subscription of thirty say it's thirty bucks a, m- a month just to some service just for the ease of thing, if all I listen to on that service is void for that for that month then void should get my thirty dollars mm. being split across it's being split across every artist in the world or justin timberlake still gets part of that thirty thirty dollars never going to listen to that you know so and and they can do this it's really easy for them to do it so that what the what people are listening to it's just i think governments have to step in and regulate it somehow because the people that should be getting paid aren't getting paid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's a really interesting point because governments are starting to regulate a lot of things and they're starting to catch up with, you know, new digital ways of delivering content and realizing that it doesn't work with either their agenda or not, but it yeah, yeah. still doesn't seem to benefit creatives. Like we saw that with the news.com thing where yeah. they will, they want to regulate it. And it's like, who's going to step in for creatives. Do you think it, it, people need to withdraw their content like some really influential people need to do that or do you think that's a publicity stunt well i don't know i mean that's what neil young just did right so Mm. i mean i don't know if that's going to backfire and the you know he didn't want to be associated with a certain podcaster or whatever and so he protested but i mean i don't know how much that affects their bottom line or whatever They they don't they probably don't care there's so much other old catalog stuff that's how they make their money yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. True. So when you when we talk about this grant, you know, is there strings attached? I've never got a grant, so I don't know. Like, is it just kind of like, yeah, you wrote the best application, here's the money, you know, we're trusting you'll do it. Yeah. I don't know. But you go, Nat, sorry. Well, yeah, I mean, kind of. They're kind of just, you know, I mean, it's a process that we have to do to get a grant. But at the same time, like, um. I don't think there's really strings attached. Like they're just, it's just, yeah, it's actually really awesome. You do it, you deliver, and then that's really it. Um, I, I think the not strings attached, but these grant programs invest in stuff that they see as a viable thing that could could go on and obviously support, brings a lot of support to the community. Um, because like the long-term sort of picture of this, as we were discussing before, is, is like a regular thing. Um, we may even, after this season, lose the seasons as such and make it more of just like a, a pretty much a consistent thing where obviously around stuff like Splendor in the Grass and Blues Fest and um, Falls Festival, all of these festivals that are happening that bring like, a, you know, a ton of international bands to the country, they're opportunities for us to obviously record a bunch of sessions in and around those times. So, um having it more like once we get into a model where it's consistent, our funding model is consistent, it could just be coming out regularly, whether that's fortnightly or, or weekly. But um, yeah, so I think that they can try to see that kind of picture. But obviously until we get our viewership up, we, we don't get a double-edged sword. Like you need the audience to um, get the funding, but you need the funding to get the audience. So yeah, exactly. at the moment we're just sort of in that and state. I mean, like I would, I would recommend that anyone that's creative look into how many different grants. There are grants for everything, but it's pretty 
it's pretty full on to try and do it yourself if you've never done it. And there are people out there that that do grant writing that you only have to pay if if you get the grant. You know, so it's sort of it's a win win. It's like the the people that that do this grant writing sort of stuff, they know exactly what to do, and and they're happy to recommend you what you know how how to do it. They ask you for what you need to to supply to make it a good grant, and um, yeah, it's. It, it, yeah, it's, I mean, dealing with any kind of bureaucracy, government sort of stuff is heady at the best of times. <laughs> like it's, you know, yeah. When, they know when, how to write it so a grant reader reads it and it ticks all the boxes that they want to read. Exactly. Uh, and then all you got to do is deliver with what what you said you're going to do, and it's you know, it's, it, there's no strings attached. I think it's interesting, like we see on the news and stuff, oh, the arts the arts sector has had funding cut from it. Um, oh, the pool is never fully zero, but obviously it gets lowered. Do you think do you think that actually translates into actually getting harder to get a grant? Or do you think it's kind of like this fantasy amount of money anyway that just gets divvied up? Um, I think that potentially the concept of getting grants wasn't as publicly known prior to pretty recently, maybe the last five to ten years. I mean, the um, people, there's always been grants given out, but it tended to be for more traditional forms of the arts, like, you know, the Australian Ballet or or operas and, and like, actually established organisations, whereas people like us now have got a bit more of a crack. Yeah, and so that's changed over time. Do you think it's been easier for has music sort of gone up in the the realm of possibilities for grants being given to? Is that sort of what you mean? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would have yeah, it would have been really hard ten years ago to do one because we would have had to have done it ourselves. There was no grant writers out there like that. You didn't have to pay like probably the same sort of fees that you would pay for a lawyer, and um, yeah, would have been tricky. And what do you guys think is the hardest thing to budget for in something like this? Like you get all your money, how do you figure out where you're going to divvy it up? Like you've got some obviously expensive costs that that come in. How do you make sure you're allocating it to the right things? Is there any tips for someone that comes into a lot of money and making sure that they spend it wisely? I think you just got to, I mean, for us it wasn't that hard because we're, we're quoting it like... Um, we're quoting it like a recording session in the studio and then a film shoot that we, so both parties, we do those things anyway. So it was kind of like we both quote on it and like that, that's what it costs. Obviously, we've had to, there's quite a lot of in-kind um, um, allocation, um, con- contribution as well from both sides because the grant hasn't, you know, it's not full industry rate, but we'll, we'll try and get up to that point um, soon. But always remember that filming anything and recording anything always costs a lot more than what you probably think it will. Like, there's so many expenses on a film shoot that, you know, you only have to try and do one once to realise, oh, shit, I didn't think about that. And you're talking about, okay, you've got 17 people there for 12 hours a day. You've got to feed them twice. Um, You've got, you know, all of these little things, all of these little consumables and all these, like, extra little things that all really do add up um, and become quite expensive. Uh, And then obviously marketing is like the big one that you can never spend too much on, I don't think, on on a project like this because you've really got to, like with this one, we want absolute max exposure and it's not just an Aussie audience that we want to try and tackle either because we think, you know, obviously some of the bands are from overseas but also a lot of the bands that we have in have followings overseas, maybe even bigger followings overseas. So we're going to be trying to obviously get them. That's a great thing about a thing. But, yeah, the hardest thing to do um, budget-wise is just, yeah, be real about what stuff costs because it always costs more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. You know, we always try and be like, oh, it won't be that. Oh, actually, no, it's going to be that much. Okay, that's going to be that much. Like it's, yeah. It's, it's always more expensive than you think it's going to be. And, yeah, being real about it from the beginning is just you're better off being real from the start and then figuring out how to get it rather than getting to the end and being like, well, you know, we don't have the funding to do that or whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. And because we're a little bit loose also on, um, on 
how how much material we're capturing from these artists like we sort of say 20 to 30 minutes which is essentially it's like a third variation over the whole thing obviously that that co- that takes more in at, when you're filming it's only that extra 10 minutes or whatever it's you know not much to to mention but all of that mixing that the audio doing all of the post for the um for the for eight, you know eight cameras someone's got to watch through all of that and you know, it's all got to be graded, and so everything it just multiplies. It blows blows right out. You know, you don't you don't really know until the end. Yeah, it's the unseen bits, right? Like all yeah, the yeah. editing. You know, you spend three times as long editing sometimes than you actually did on set. Yeah, it's about, it takes about. I edited most of the last sessions, and it was probably about three or four days per session, and then the grade would be about two days. So it ends up post ends up being a week. Yeah, it's yeah. that's wild. First yeah. session, yeah. so it's you know, and we're up, obviously if things happen faster because we've learnt from what works, what doesn't. But yeah, it's, it's still it's probably going to be up about four days, I reckon, post. Yeah, and, and, let, then and let, we, as well. we did it all on GoPros and did a live, a live mix and a live feed. Then it would be really quick. I don't, I don't even reckon we need a film. I'm on board. Next one, <laughs> I'm ready to oh go. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> You guys are such stirrers. You can oh, lean into AI. Right. There's no GoPros. I was like, one day on the last session, I was like, we're not having GoPros. <laughs> Steve's like, I've got one up in the top corner for you to use. Like, yeah. So, if, in. It's a good in, filters you can use. Yeah, exactly. The toaster and all those ones. Yeah. So, in closing out, what, do you, what has each of you learnt in your time, you know, being creative? What's the, what's the big key thing that each of you have learnt? Start with you, in, Alex. In general, like being creative in general, or yeah, yeah, being up in the airlock. Yeah, what can you offer to other people that are, you know, earlier on in their journey? Cool. It's a big one, right? Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, no, I think just keep going, and like you got to, you got to bash your head against the wall. They say the definition of insanity is when you do the same thing but expect a different result. But I think with creativity and like, especially in the arts, you have to just keep doing that. And hopefully, and you will one day get a different result. You'll break through that glass ceiling or that like, that thing. Um, Yeah, you really have to just keep going. It's not easy. Um, It's not easy to get funding. It's not easy to do anything, but the reward is so goddamn amazing. Like um, Mm. that, you know, it's totally worth all of that, in my opinion. Nat, what's yours? When you get to a point where you think you should give up, don't. Because that's when you're just about to do something really cool. That's happened to me a few times and I've just about given up and I've been just on the edge of just being like, you know what, I'm done. And then I don't and then something amazing happens. So it's just like, you know, just before just before you're about to give up, just go a little bit further and see where you end up. Because when you're at that point, that's when you know that something's going to happen. Cool. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe from my personal experience. <laughs> and Ian, what have you got? I think there's two things. Like the first one being um, patience. Like you've got to, you know, that whole thing, I think it was Ringo that said hurry up and wait sort of thing. And um, you, you really do like things, things, there's a lot of sitting around waiting for the actual moment that's the important bit of the actual performance or or when you capture something so that's a big one to just somehow be patient yet ready and don't let it rat, rattle you and the other one would be um just that don't be disappointed if things don't go the way you actually planned because quite often the the things that you didn't plan and don't expect are the exciting rewarding bits like alex was saying like you know, that's sometimes you surprise yourself and you're like, fuck, I didn't mean to do that. That's actually better than what I'd planned to do. So, yeah. Awesome. And where can people see Up in the Airlock Season 2 when it's out and catch up on Season 1? On their favourite... Favourite streaming YouTube. service of choice. <laughs> yeah, YouTube. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Facebook. Add us on Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, Facebook. Facebook. You're going to see some sick 
Yeah, and check out all the, the last 10 There's some big stuff. I'll put all the links in the show notes so anyone that is listening uh, can check it out there. But thank you so much for all of your time. I know 45 minutes is a big ask out of your days, but I think it's been really valuable for people to hear from experts, you know, what it's like to put together something of this size and to know not to be afraid to, to chase it.